So from the beginning of um, the Lord's ministry on earth, he began to prepare for the coming of the new covenant that would be made for humanity through his own sacrificial work on the cross. Everything he did started to prepare people for this. And Jesus understood that he'd only be in the world a short time, and the kingdom that he would bring would be like a building with a stone foundation with himself as the chief cornerstone. And that church would be built on a foundation of chosen apostles and prophets that would, ri- that would, that would be the place where his church would be built upon. The church made of living stones. It would rise throughout the ages to become a place where God would dwell both individually and corporately. Now it was paramount that the foundation of this new covenant structure was started from a solid foundation. Before the world was created, Jesus saw through the pages of of history. He saw all the way through the history, uh, the exact place where he would be incarnated where he would take on human flesh, and where he would become the savior of the human race. It was all planned out. It was mapped out before time began. He foreordained the circumstances in which he would be born into. The crowds were pressing on Jesus because they seen him at that time as a celebrity. And um, he would have catered to them, but... uh, That wasn't his plan. He knew that most of the people that were trying to get near to him were just there because of the show. They were there because he they were looking at him as a novelty. They were shallow. But there were those in the crowd that Jesus knew that would be pivotal to the foundation of this structure that we call the church, rising from the from the ground level in the new covenant to become this wonderful place where God dwells, a place that you and I are a part of today. So he chose certain individuals before the beginning of time to become the foundation level for this building called the church. And each of these 12 disciples were called according to a certain plan that God had established And Jesus wanted to impart these men with his authority as they would be the ones that would start the church in the direction that it would go. And him being the chief cornerstone, he set the level, he set the ground rules for it all. And those apostles that were near him were a foundational level so that the church would rise in in a level fashion in the way that God intended His purpose was to establish his kingdom in the world through specific people foundational to what would take place throughout the ages. So let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 3. Our text today is from verses 13 to 35. And my sermon this morning is on the identity of Jesus and his true family. Starting with verse 13 in our text, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So many people look at this group of 12 and they wonder what it was that Jesus saw in these guys to become his inner circle. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, we're all fishermen. And uh, it's likely that Thomas and Nathaniel and two other disciples were also uh, probably fishermen as well. Because according to the biblical account, um, 
If you see in John chapter 21, 2 to 8, you see that there were seven disciples that after Jesus had raised from the dead that went out and they went back out fishing with Peter. So it's very possible that not just the four disciples, Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, that they were fishermen. There probably was other fishermen amongst them as well. The Peter that uh, we knew from the New Testament accounts and the early church accounts, he became the leader of the early church eventually. And Peter, as we know, had a very enthusiastic, you might say enthusiastic personality. He was always the one to jump in. And sometimes he would jump in too quickly and sometimes just at the right time. There are times where Peter had his foot stuck in his mouth. We see that in scripture. Times when Peter stepped out of the boat and went walking across the water towards Jesus. Times where Peter drew his sword to defend the Lord. So that was Peter. James and John, uh, Boanerges, Boanerges, sons of thunder. Makes you wonder how they got that uh, nickname from Jesus, eh? Maybe it was when they, uh, when they were walking around and the Samaritans did something that wasn't kosher, and uh, they wanted to fry the the Samaritans. Should we send fire down from heaven and have them destroyed? You know. I don't know, but James, uh, James and John had this nickname, Sons of Thunder, so I imagine they had robust personalities. Eh? You, you think? <laughs> I, I don't know. All of us have maybe different personalities, but these guys, Sons of Thunder. Hmm. Okay, Matthew, who's also called Levi in another place in the scripture, um, was a tax collector. And, and he would have been a very wealthy man. And not well thought of by the people that uh, he was collecting his taxes from. Tax collectors were not popular fellows. And, uh, you know, rather than serving the Roman government, Matthew followed Jesus. He left his trade behind. He repented and he came to the Lord. And the Lord called him. The Lord saw something in Matthew um, that was really significant, and he became part of the twelve. Um, James the Zealot was a revolutionary who turned from his, his former ways, and uh, the Zealots, just a second here, I've got to untangle this, or I'm going to trip on it. Okay, the Zealots were known for being uh, mercenaries of the Jewish people. They were the ones that were pushing to take armed stance against the Romans, and basically uh, they were almost like Jewish terrorists in the Roman state. Now, Simon the Zealot, what would Jesus see in a zealot? Well, the zeal that this man had to defy the Romans and to overthrow the Romans was laid aside, and he became zealous for Jesus. Now, all these other apostles, you know, there's not a lot said about who they were and what they did and all that kind of thing. But Jesus saw in these common men something that was what he, he could work with to build the foundation level for the church. And Jesus took these men in and they became very close with him. He poured into them. Even Judas... Jesus chose Judas with the same ministry as the other 11, knowing full well that Judas' heart was not fully his. Judas kept something back from Jesus, and the Bible tells us that he was a thief, and he helped himself to the disciples' treasury. Yet Jesus brought him into the inner circle as well, even though Judas was not who he appeared to be on the outside. Judas had a heart problem, but Jesus still brought him in because it was important for this to transpire. It was important for a lesson that Judas could be kind of like a chameleon on the outside. 
it's kind of a lesson for today, right? Not everybody is who you think they are. And Jesus still welcomes those people knowing full well exactly how they're going to turn. It's not that Jesus forces that anyone to uh, betray him or reject him or anything like that. He gives everybody opportunity, but some people will take that choice and will trample it and will throw it out and they'll choose to be um, against the kingdom of God in the end. Hmm. Jesus loves everybody and wishes that none would perish and that all would come to repentance. So then, this is the story of how he chose these disciples. There's not a whole lot more detail about it, but they were specifically chosen because God saw something in them that needed to be part of this. So Jesus then, in verse 20, entered a house. And again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Hmm, interesting. When people saw that Jesus was uh, in this house, there were people at this time, okay, there's a lot of attention being drawn to the ministry of the Lord. When he healed the sick and, and did all the things that he was doing, man, there was attention being drawn. They were coming from all over the land, coming to go and see Jesus. They knew that something great was going to happen. And the crowds longed to see what was going to happen. And he and his disciples, it says, were in this house, but because of everything that was happening, there was so much of a crowd pressing in on them that they weren't even able to eat. There was no privacy. There was no, they were just crowded around by people all the time. When Jesus' family heard about this and thought that um, this is not healthy, this is not good, they tried to come to Jesus' rescue. They thought they would help. They thought it was crazy that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have the time to eat properly. And historically speaking, through the Bible, we see that God's servants are often, even well-meaningly, often misjudged by people that don't really understand what's going on. Jesus, in this circumstance, he wasn't rude to his family. But he didn't leave with them when they went to the house and asked him to go. The motives of the family may have been right, but Jesus knew that it was his time right now to be in the field that he was in and work. He knew this. They might have wanted to protect him from all this attention being focused on him and maybe thought that his ministry efforts might not have good effects on his health. Maybe they thought about the inevitable conflict that would be coming with all of the rumors of the teachers of the law coming to resist him. Maybe they thought that they would swoop in and pluck him out of there before things got really hot. We don't know exactly why his family wanted to yard him out. But they said, he, they said to the people, we think he's out of his mind. You're, Jesus, you're crazy. Look at, look at what's happening here. They're all crowding and you can't even eat. You and your disciples can't eat. You're crazy. What are you doing? Get, let, come out of here with us. Leave with us. Jesus' family knew him before he began his earthly ministry. They knew him. They knew where he came from. He was a boy that grew up in Nazareth, which is in the same region where they were. I mean, Galilee is a fairly small region, and Nazareth is kind of on the interior part of it, and they're near Capernaum, which is near the coast of the Sea of Galilee, right? So his family would have been all over this region. During his early years, he didn't display the miraculous powers of God, so nobody was being drawn to him. But now, now that Jesus started his ministry and his purpose, the power of God was working through him, and that drew flocks and crowds of people who were needy, people who were curious, all kinds of people, people who were critical. It drew all kinds of attention. Now, Jesus 
was a regular boy, but what was happening right now was nothing that was regular. It was not regular. It was so irregular. This house was so pressed, they couldn't even eat. And it doesn't say um, who these family members were that were coming to get him out, who said that he must, you know, he's out of his mind a little bit here, man. Um, it wasn't his mother and his brothers, because his mothers and brothers come into this later. So maybe it was aunts, uncles, I don't know, cousins, cousins of the Lord, un uncles, aunts. Maybe it was grandparents. We don't hear anything about the grandparents of the Lord. We don't know who these relatives were, but they came. They came. They came with good intentions, possibly. But nevertheless, they asked Jesus to do something that was not in the will of the Father. Now, if Jesus would have yielded to his family's demands, he would have played right into the hands of those who were opposing him. Jesus was not out of his mind for doing what he was doing and pouring himself out to the people and calling his disciples to do the same. But he was demonstrating the power of God in a way that nobody had ever seen before. And there's a lesson to be found in this story that every believer can take home today. Now, the quiet path that's most easily taken to avoid any conflicts or upsetting the status quo, I want to say this, is not very often the right path to be taken. Did you hear that? There's an easy way to avoid all the trouble and just sort of kind of come in at the tail end and just sort of watch what's going on. But most of the time when we minister the gospel and good things start to happen and we see a measure of kingdom success, it can absorb a great deal of our personal comfort time. And this might look on the outset as being unhealthy and it might appear that way to our family. As a matter of fact, pouring out our lives into the ministries of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the church can seem crazy to some people who think that your time could be spent better in self-care. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a balance in all of this. There is time for self-care and there's time for sabbaticals. But there is time to roll up your sleeves and to get to work. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that is established not through osmosis, but through the working of the disciples, the people that Jesus called. And Jesus himself poured himself out at great inconvenience to his personal leisure. I just want you to think about this for a minute. Now, there is a, a balance to this. Sometimes people get this Messiah complex, right? Where they think that everything to do with going out there is rests on their shoulders. And so they just burn themselves at bo like a candle burned down to the very end, burn themselves out, and then they, they crash. Right? Now, that's not what we're talking about here. There is appropriate times. We see Jesus in his own ministry. There are times when he retreated out to pray and to rest. But when there, is, when there is a ministry to be done, Jesus rolled up his sleeves and asked his disciples to roll up their sleeves along with him. There's a time to rest and a time to retreat and a time to work. When God begins to move powerfully, that is not the time to step back the time to engage. And Paul himself, the apostle, said that he was a drink offering, like a drink offering poured out upon the sacrifice. What does that mean? In Christianity, when we give to the Lord and we pour ourselves out for the sake of others, that's where we find our strength. Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God will give us strength the ourselves to fulfill the mission that he has called us to. 
but we must step out in faith and trust that he will. And he will. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, 24-7, we're to be unbalanced with this, right? There's times for retreat. But sometimes I think in our culture, because of North American culture in particular, comfort is the biggest thing. Man, if I can have comfort and I can just sort of coast along, that's ideal. That's ideal. The thought of the pain of working for the kingdom is unpopular in a lot of places. That's why you see all these gigantic, enormous mega churches developing where people just come and they sit and they leave, and that's it. It becomes a coliseum of entertainment where the musicians tickle the ears, the guy in the, in the tight jeans and the trendy outfit, right? Rock star guy, who comes up and entertains. Oh yeah, we had a great time of worship this morning. And the pastor comes up and gives this blazing sermon that uh, stirs the soul. But that's it. That's Christianity. That becomes Christianity where it's just this stained blocks, stained, stained glass window aquarium where we come in and the odd fish, you know, bites on the lure that gets thrown over the pulpit. That's not the purpose of the church. It's not. We don't want to be that. I'm sorry. It's great to have good preaching. I'm sure you guys would say that, right? It's good to have good preaching. It's good to have good worship music and that sort of thing. But that's not why we come here. We come here because of Jesus. We don't come here to have our ears tickled and our sentiments excited only to return back to our little place to do it all over again the next week. It's not about edification of me for the sake of edification of me. It's about pouring myself out and preparation for me to pour myself out into my community, however that may look. And everyone is different. Self-care is important, but it can't be perpetual. Just like a vacation can be good, but permanent vacation is unhealthy. It has to, there has to be a transition. God's people, it's time for us to work for the kingdom. Jesus is coming soon. The people out there need Jesus. And not everybody has the same spiritual gifts, but we work together to see the kingdom of God established, to see hearts won for Jesus Christ and disciples made. It's not just about commitments and coming up to just as I am at the end of the service. It's about making disciples. And Jesus invested in the 12. He was interested in pouring himself out into those disciples so that they could in turn pour out into the lives of others who, could turn, who would in turn pour out into the lives of others and so on and so on and so on. And this is how the kingdom of God is built and established. And it's done not in the natural self. It's done in the power of the spirit. If we try to do this on our own, if we go out there and try to work and do good deeds with our own strength and our own, forget it. It's not going to work. I mean, the Rotary Club is great, but that's not who we are. Right? They perform a certain thing, but the church is supposed to be the Rotary Club with a heart of God. You know, we're supposed to do good works that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. It's not all just about taking away human suffering because human suffering is going to be with us. It's taking away human suffering for the purpose of showing them how the Lord Jesus Christ thinks about them. And being the hands and feet of Jesus. Good, you know, the Samaritan's purse when they came in here during the forest fires. Awesome. They did so much. But not only did they do things, but they talked with people. And they spoke to people about Jesus. And they worked with the local church. They worked with us. This is what we're talking about, right? So, anyways. In Matthew's gospel, we see Jesus say, in Matthew 9, 35 to 38, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. 
when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers out into the harvest field. The late theologian Warren Wiersbe once stated this. He said, when we pray as he commanded, when you think about the Lord's Prayer, when we pray as he commanded, we will see how he felt. Or, sorry, we will see what he saw. When we pray that, sincerely, we will see what he saw, feel what he felt, and do what he would do. God will multiply our lives as we share in the great harvest that is already your life. You, or that is already right. You want to see life to the fullest? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with great abandon. Serve the, cast your whole life towards the serving the Lord. And that will bring meaning and, and joy to you like nothing else. When you begin to pour yourself out for the kingdom, there is a great joy in that. It's beautiful. I would encourage everybody to think, Lord, what have you given me to pour out for you for the sake of your kingdom? Every believer needs to think about this because this is an every believer thing. You are the body of Christ and each, part, each one of you is a part of it. And it doesn't matter if your family calls you crazy. They might think you're crazy for pouring yourself out to this. Absolutely. They might call us madmen. They did that with the Apostle Paul. They called him mad. Right? They did this with Jesus. Even famous evangelist Dwight L. Moody, when he was ministering, he was active, an active preacher last century in, in Chicago. Great things happened through that ministry. But he was known by family and certain people in his family and friends as crazy moody. Great. Why would you pour yourself out for this? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you, why would you go out of your way for this? But if God is prompting us to do some work for him, and we re re receive resistance from family or friends who call us crazy, like Jesus, we would do well to dig in to a God-honoring resolve to say, no, I am not running from this mission unless God makes it plain that I should leave. I'm, I'm right here. I'm pouring myself in. There's going to be consequences to us standing firm on that resolve. Make no mistake. The Lord doesn't promise that it's going to be easy if we stay put in a ministry opportunity that he's planted us in. As a matter of fact, just like what we see with Jesus coming up here, if we plant ourselves in a ministry opportunity that God wants us to participate in, we may encounter more than just a little bit of trouble. More than just a little bit of trouble. Just as Jesus encountered some trouble by staying put where he was in this circumstance. But if we're acting within the will of God, the Lord's higher glorious purpose will eventually be revealed through the suffering that we might have to go through to endure as we are faithful to God's call. And just to reinforce what I'm saying here in this text, Jesus stayed put, and then what happened? Then those teachers of the law came, and they were being used by the enemy to attack the Lord. It appears that through the word of multitudes that were um, hearing about Jesus, that the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem heard about what he was doing, and the Pharisees talked, and the teachers of the law talked amongst themselves, and a contingent of these guys came from Jerusalem to see what was going on in this Galilean ministry that this guy was promoting. And since they had talked amongst themselves and decided that Jesus was not towing the line with their religious order and their, um, I guess you could say, their goals for their religious order, he was doing things that weren't part of the, the program. They, they determined that they were going to destroy him. And the teachers of the law in verse 22 said, says, 
And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Now, Jesus was an anomaly to the religious system of the day. He didn't operate within the status quo that they were promoting. He wasn't your average rabbi. The teachers of the law, they couldn't deny that Jesus was performing great miracles. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't deny his healing power, but Jesus did not meet their expectations of what the Messiah should be looking like. He didn't meet their expectations. So therefore, he's teaching these spiritual truths that threatened the institution. And rather than rallying the people to build a political kingdom like their forefather David had done, Jesus was doing something else. He wasn't becoming the king of the zealots. He was becoming the prince of peace. And that bothered them because that's not, that didn't fit into their thinking. That's not what David did. David slew his ten thousands. He was teaching the people spiritual truths. They were looking for the Messiah who was in the same order as the Maccabees. If you look at Jewish history in the intertestamental period between the Old and New Testament writing, um, the Maccabees rose up against Greece and kicked the Greeks out because they had defiled the temple of the Lord. And they were looking for someone like the Maccabees. But Jesus um, didn't do that. So they couldn't get that around in their head. They, they, they had to attribute his power to something else. Well, if it's not God, because we're convinced that we're right and the way that we're doing things is right, and because we're convinced that we're doing what is right, then he must be wrong. They looked at the Son of God as though he was the problem, when in fact their hearts were whitewashed sepulchers filled with dead men's bones. They looked at Jesus and accused Jesus as not only being the agent of evil, but being the source of evil. Why? Because Jesus was commanding evil spirits to come out of people, and they were coming out. So they said that it was the prince of demons that was in Jesus, and that's why the demons were coming out. See in verse 23. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will, cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven of all their sins and every slander that they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. So immediately, Jesus addressed this, you know, you by the prince of demons are doing all this stuff. He addressed it. He spoke in a parable to address the thought Stating that a kingdom that fights against itself will fall. And he questions the teachers of the law to this end. It's true. You can't have any organization that's divided against itself stand. An div organization that's divided against itself is going to fall. This is principles. Jesus talked plainly with these guys. If he was part of the kingdom of darkness, why would he ask the henchmen that were doing his bidding to come out of people that were, they were destroying. He, it doesn't make any sense. He wouldn't do it. Therefore, Jesus was telling them that he was not Satan in human flesh, but he was destroying Satan's work. And that he was showing by what he was doing and commanding those evil spirits out, he was showing that he had more authority and more power than Satan. teachers of the law, in fact, were blaspheming the Holy Spirit by attributing the holy works done by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit to that of Satan. The sin is unpardonable. Members of Jesus' family, they misunderstood him, but these scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law who came from Jerusalem or whoever they were, the, the teachers from Jerusalem, they viciously and cynically attacked Jesus, the author of creation. 
Because they had already said in their mind that their goal was to destroy him because he wasn't agreeing with their order. They wanted to discredit Jesus. Jesus had to bear all of this. He's the creator of the universe. He had to bear all of this. Why did he bear it? Because he stayed in the house, people. Because he stayed in the house. Because he did the work that God the Father had called him to. And there was consequences to that. It wasn't nice. It wasn't easy. And it wasn't very comfortable for him to be accused of being a prince of darkness in human flesh when he was the author of life. <laughs> As Christians, if you're serving the Lord in the capacity that he's asked you to and you're doing the right thing, you're going to have resistance. The enemy is going to come at you. You can guarantee it he's going to come at you to try and discourage you. He's going to come at you to try and throw you off and accuse you. He's the accuser of the brethren. Just because you serve the Lord in an area of ministry in the church doesn't mean it's going to be a cakewalk. It's not always going to be just simple Simon. It's not. Sometimes it gets complicated and ugly, and you have to bear through it. But you have an advocate. You have the Holy Spirit within you who will give you strength to endure anything that you have to go through. So don't be discouraged. If you find that you're being resisted by, by, by evil when you're doing the right thing, be confident that you're doing the right thing because Jesus himself was resisted in the same way. And so were all of the apostles. So was any servant of the Lord. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is conscious and hardened opposition to the truth. Some people freak out a little bit about this, and they think, have I ever blasphemed the Holy Spirit? The fact that you're asking that question probably means that you haven't, okay? But if you deny the working of the Holy Spirit and attribute it to something else consistently, and you harden your heart against the Lord and his gospel, eventually your hard heart will be impenetrable, and you will get to that place where you can't repent because your heart is so hard. That's why we need to be praying for our hardened friends and relatives that don't know the Lord. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit would soften their hearts. Lord, help them to see. Give them the catalyst, Lord, to, to see the truth of your gospel for what it is. And Oh, Lord, protect them from this hardened heart that will take them to that point where they will not repent, no matter what. That's, should, that's a prayer for us, to pray for the people that God's put in our path. You guys, God has not given you your connections for without reason. Some of you have some really brutal connections. People that maybe are involved in different religions. People that are hard. People that are atheists. People that just say, fooey on God, you know, Jesus is... Yeah, yeah. You might get that, right? But don't, don't forget this. Yes, there may be someone like Judas out there. Yeah, there will be for sure. And, and there might be people like these scribes who won't even let Jesus start in on them. Okay? But you are where you are as a light, as a, as a catalyst for the gospel. God is asking you to pour your life into those people and yeah, they're, you're going to get hurt. Maybe you're, <laughs> maybe you're going to get rejected. You might be outrightly opposed and, and called something that, it, that, that you aren't. But don't be discouraged. So the crowds, they wanted Jesus to behave like a loyal Jew and honor his family by listening to them. And then we see this here. Then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived. So his other family tried to, tried to get him to leave, right? And now Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. We're talking Mary, right? Mother of Jesus and his brothers, half-brothers. Standing outside, they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Those people would expect, their culture would expect them, 
Jesus to honor the wishes of his mother and his immediate family and to leave the house. Again, to leave the house. He'd just been through this great big deal with the, the teachers of the law calling him, you know, devil in, in flesh, right? And he's like, the creator, can you imagine the audacity? You're just doing good because you love people that you created and they're calling you d- the devil? Oh, the Lord stays put again. He doesn't leave when his mother, his own mother comes. And, and his brother, his half-brothers come. Now, history tells us the half-brothers never followed the Lord until after he died on the cross and was resurrected. But they did. But the mother, okay, well, yeah. It would have been normal for him to listen to the advice of his mother and come out. But no. What did he say? 33. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will or God's will is my brother and sister and mother. See, this is emphasizing what we're talking about here already. What's important is God's kingdom more than anything else. Many people of the Roman Catholic persuasion ask why the evangelicals don't pray to Mary or speak to, to, to Mary to, to go to Jesus on their behalf. Um, now, Jesus didn't dishonor Mary as his earthly mother. He didn't. But he made it very clear that spiritual relationships take precedent over the natural ones. If someone in your family is asking you to not do the work of Christ that God has called you to, the choice is clear. I'm sorry, Mom, but I've got to stay put. I've got to do the work of my Father in heaven who has called me to be doing this. And I know that you might not understand, but no, I can't stop doing what I'm doing. I can't leave the place where the Lord has put me. This passage reminds us as believers, that the strength of relationships that we forge with fellow believers, as Jesus did with his apostles, those bonds are deeper than the flesh ties of family. They're deeper than the blood relative tie when those relatives are unsaved. Because they have a whole different paradigm the unsaved people that, that know us and that are around us, they have a whole different view of life than we do. And God's going to tell us to do things that are opposed to that paradigm that they have, that goal that they have. Maybe they, they think you're nuts for leaving your job to go to minister to somebody overseas. You're crazy, man. Why would you give up your career to do that? doesn't make sense. Fiscally, it's a suicidal thing. Maybe God asks you to do something, um, you know, that's possibly something that might bring shame on your family. you got an upper-class family, and God tells you that you should be down on the street helping people off the street in drug addiction. And they're concerned that you're going to get tied up and you're going to ruin the family name by getting your hands into that and, you know, they don't understand that what you're trying to do. Like, I've had people say that those drug addicts are a wa- waste of skin. I just wish they would off themselves. <laughs> There's that kind of perspective. I was listening to <sighs> something on YouTube. And some guy on YouTube, this famous preacher in the United States who has this great big following said right out, he says, homosexuals, I wish they'd all shoot themselves. They're a waste of time, basically. Is what he said. They're a waste of time. They're nothing but predators that are going to hurt my children and yours too. So they might as well just go and shoot themselves. Oh my goodness. We can't have this kind of mentality. No, we don't agree with that lifestyle. And now the Bible says that it's sin. But what else does the Bible say is sin? So many things out there are sin. So, 
as Christians, we've got to be careful. Be careful. Jesus came to save sinners. And that doesn't mean telling sinners to go to and shoot themselves. What an audacity, to, what an affront to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And peop, hundreds of thousands of people are following this guy. Some of the stuff, oh man. I was just like, it's just heart-wrenching. Heart-wrenching. But you see, the world might not see things the way that we see them. The Bible says when your enemy uh, does something wrong to you, you're supposed to, what, love your enemy? How does that look? Your enemy's thirsty? What? Give him something to drink. Your enemy's hungry? Feed them. This is the way of Christ. This is the way of the cross. Okay. Um, being about God's business, doing the will of the Father. You see, God has called you to be his child. He's called you into the family to be a child of God. And being a child of God means caring about the Father's business. And what's the will of the Father? What's the will of the Father? See, before we can tell other people about the Father, we need to have a relationship with him. Otherwise, what are we going to tell them about? It's really important, folks, that we, we don't um, grow shallow and let our love for the Lord grow cold. Because when our love goes cold and we go shallow, we stop growing in the Lord. And our witness out there is ineffective because of that sometimes. The world needs to see hearts ablaze from the Holy Spirit working in and through them. So the first thing is the will of the Father is for us to warm up towards God. Don't let your hearts be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Don't let it happen. Go to the Lord and say, God, have mercy on me. I know my propensity to wander in my spirit and to be the person that I'm not to be. But Jesus, I need you. I need you, Lord. I need your Holy Spirit to soften up this heart of mine and help me to beat in my heart with what beats in your heart and to see through these eyes what you see through your eyes and what I hear is what you hear and what I do is what you would do, Lord. That's the first step in doing the will of the Father. Because then, when we're close, we're walking closely with God, we hear the Holy Spirit, and He leads us, and we listen. And that's when we intercept people out there that need to hear and need to see the gospel in action. The Lord will take His church and will use us. But there is examples in Revelation of churches that have lost their first love Return to back, back to the way it was before, to the way it was at first, where you were passionately in love with Christ, where you were so thankful for him forgiving you for your sins as a sinner that deserved death, that deserved judgment, that you're so thankful to him for forgiving you that your heart burst with gratitude. God, since you've been so good to me, what can I give back to you, Lord? Return to your first love if your heart has grown cold. Then God will tell you what to do next. He'll put you in the room, whatever that room is, and tell you to stay put. Or he'll tell you to leave that room and go to another place. There's examples of that in Scripture too. And you will go because your heart is soft to God. And, you know, there's a song by Keith Green, I make my life a prayer to you. I only want to do what you want me to. That heartbeat right there of that song. You ever, Keith Green's an old 70s guy, 80 guy. <laughs> Maybe you're not into that kind of music, but. I challenge you, listen to that song. I make my life a prayer to you. I only want to do what you want me to. That's what Jesus is calling his church to. That's what he was calling his disciples to. The will of the Father. 
I only want to do what you want me to, not what I want to, what you want me to. And then the Spirit of God uses us and impacts the world around us for the kingdom. Amen. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And also, if we're going to be involved in God's work of our Father, He's going to ask us to yield to Him, but then He's going to send us into the battle. Yield to God first, right? And then resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Being involved in the work of the Father means that we're going to be confronted by evil because we're going to be going against strong men. If the strong man is free to do what he wants, we cannot plunder his house. You see, the problem we face as a church and as individual Christians is all this sin and all these demons running around trying to spoil everything, right? That's, we face this. This is real. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness in high places. The de demons bring bondage, enslavement, hurt, pain, sickness, death, and hardness of heart wherever they go. Purely out of hatred for the Lord. So Jesus, why did he come? He came to set people free from the power of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 says, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared, here it is, was to destroy the devil's work. And part of our business as children of the Most High God is to step out and to resist the evil that is coming at us. This involves casting out demons. It, come, it, it, it involves not following the pressure of Satan's agents to, to compromise our testimony and our, our lives. It, it, it comes in resisting the devil in prayer as intercessory prayer warriors and standing on the promises of the word of God when everything else is falling down around us. Resisting the devil. But first of all, yielding to the Lord. And what's the result? He will flee. There's no lack of demons to resist out there, my friends. You know this. We wrestle in a dark world right now. There's a lot of things going on out there. And we need to be submitted to the Lord and in prayer if we're ever even going to hope to see the strong men in this age bound and in this community. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord, that anything is done. And as his disciples, Christ-like ones, we're called to follow in his example. But we are told this promise in 1 John 4.4. 4. You, dear children, are from God. See? You, dear children, who have become children of the Most High God are his saints. You are from God because you were born because of the goodness of God and his grace on you. You were born again. No longer do you belong to yourselves, but you belong to him. You are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me?